So, Seamus, I've been thinking about moving. Uh, right now, interest rates are real low, and uh, I've got a ex- kind of expensive house in California, and I kind of want to get out of California, and I don't know. Is is where you live any better than here? Uh, no, we have the opposite problem. Uh, it, over here, uh, property values are falling because everybody's dying because our the medium age is... The median age of the population here is four or five days before death, is what I think it is. <laughs> no. It's the median. You know, there's there's some outliers of people that are still alive and will also be alive next month. So but all yeah. the all the young people have moved to Pittsburgh or something, and right. all the old people can't afford to or don't want to, and so they're just dying off and no one wants to live in their old dead people houses. Right. Well, that's it. Um, the boomers are all retiring, and they've got great big houses, and their kids, or rather their grandkids, are in no position to buy houses. They've got, you know, student loans they've got to take care of. So there's all these houses, and, you know, the, the, the younger generation isn't having a lot of kids. They don't need these big houses. And so kind of the middle of the housing market is in this slump everybody wants small places yeah, now. so wait wow. you're actively looking to move yeah we're not actively looking we just we've been thinking about it for a while and uh what with the coronavirus stuff in california is like well maybe we won't want to be here in another month wow that's what pushed you it wasn't the floods or the fires or the threat of the omnipresent threat of earthquake or the drought it was the virus yeah we'll see we've got the where i work there's uh we have a branch in wuhan and so uh it's it's kind of crazy ah yeah well we are actively looking for a place oh yeah oh you've been uh yeah, well, renting for a while yes yes and we're just getting to the point where sometime early this year might have already happened or it might happen in the next couple months where the foreclosure we went through is going to slide off our credit report hey nice and at the same time uh my m mom is now living in this apartment that's too big for her since my stepfather passed a couple months ago right more than a couple months it's yeah, it's been it's been several months, but it still feels still feels a little raw. But anyway, and she's starting to think about you know she's still active and and got all her wits, but she's you know how they say pushing eighty and getting on, yeah, getting on so, to the point where you know like I'll be here another twenty years, no need to worry. But she's like oh, any day something could happen that could slow me down. Sure. Um, so she's like, well, I'm going to need someone to care for me. And that's Heather's job. Um, you know, that's what she does for people. She goes to people's houses and takes care of old people and, you know, helps them, you know, just th with the life things. Sure. Sure. She's not like a hospice nurse, but she's a caretaker. Right. Right. Especially, you know, older people that want to keep their in independence and don't want to go to an old folks home. They want to stay in their home where they're comfortable. Instead, they'll just hire somebody to come and do all the stuff they, they're they no longer able to do around the house. And so that's yeah, what Heather sense. does. And so mom was like, you know, we sort of came to each other like, hey, we need a place. We've got no down payment. You just got a bunch of money and you're worried about the future. This, you know, could be for both good for both of us. So yeah, we've been that would be great. It would be, and in the middle of, sh like, earlier today, Mom called me, she was frantic on the phone. She was like, Gilbert's house just went on the market. Now, for... for it was Gilbert. Okay. I, I, I don't blame you for not remembering him. I wrote a post about I don't him remember years that. ago. Yeah. Well, I in The Witch Watch, my main character was named Gilbert, and he was named after <gasps> my grandfather. That Gilbert? Oh, oh, yeah. interesting. And of course, I've always had this thing about Grandpa Gilbert. Like I've, I've said on the blog, like in my mind, this man was ten feet tall. In in real life, he was barely. <laughs> in real life, it turns out he was barely over five. But you know, that's what you get when you're born before nineteen hundred. 
<laughs> right. He went way back, and he died the same year I was born. I missed him by a few months. Not that I would have remembered him, but, you know, I feel like sure. his connection to him and just all the amazing stuff he did. And everybody in the family remembers his house. His house, you know, every extended family has that one house where everybody used to meet, right? Where everybody meets. Yeah. Like, everyone meets yeah. at Uncle Ben's house because it's have a... big or... I don't have a, a real big extended family. My dad moved away from everybody because he didn't like any of them. And my mom oh, uh, moved out here. And, you know, there's a lot of other that her family's kind of spread out, too. And so we don't really have like aunts and uncles and stuff around. But we're kind of building that here. My brothers and, and I all have lots of kids. And so we're kind of like, you know, meeting at other people's houses and stuff. So I, I kind of get the feel, but I don't have a lot of personal experience with it. Right. Right. Well, we have our our extended family is very close. This isn't a family. F this is my mom's side of the family. There's no feuds or bad blood or or any of that. Everybody takes care of each other. Everybody loves each other. Uh, and everybody remembers it, that house where everybody used to meet, like for Thanksgivings or whatever, was Grandpa Gilbert's. And that house went on the market. Oh and man. And everybody in the family still remembers this house. I mean, I don't, you know, I was born in 71. The house had left the family a few years before that. But it turns out it's owned by the guy who bought it back in 1968 or whatever. This guy. Oh, man. So he probably knew it. Gilbert. Um, I, I, I don't know that he did. He probably knew the family that handled selling the house gilbert had already oh, gilbert was was in de decline at the pl that point but that means this guy's like 80 now so he was younger than i am i mean he, he was younger than i am when he moved in here and uh, i got to walk around the house and tour the house and it was a pretty emotional moment for everybody up uh, you know, there he was like, oh, yeah, Gilbert was a tinsmith, and he made those awnings out there. And I'm like, oh, you have things that were made by Gilbert. Oh, went out wow. Like, yeah. I mean, you look at the awnings, and it just looks like any industrial. I mean, or it, if I told you, it's you know, corrugated you was, tin roof, sure. Right. Yeah, and you would just assume I was probably made in a factory somewhere. But no, it was made by hand by Uncle Gilbert, or Grandpa Gilbert, probably in the 40s or 50s. And it looks absolutely crisp. There's no, I mean, it's just fine. <laughs> it could pass for wow. new. And this house is so on. It wasn't like they bashed out a wall or did anything. And that's good and bad. There's no central. There's no central HVAC system. There's no <laughs> sure. fancy. St it you know it still uses radiator heats, which means there's nothing to carry air conditioning around the house. And stuff like that. So it's it's a very non-modern house, but it was so emotional. Which would make really it like, hard to sell to other people, people who don't know the history of it, right? There's like, oh well, it's just a right. house. But to you, it's like this this location, this anchor, to both your history and to your your present. Well, the thing is, this is in the town I live in is is Butler. This house is in Saxonburg which is just pr it's this perfect distance from from uh pittsburgh everybody wants to live in saxonburg oh we we went to see it and it had only been on the market for like 18 hours or something we went we saw the house we had a long lovely talk with the people who lived there who were just the sweetest like just the most saintly old people, kind of like Peter Parker's, you know, Aunt May and Uncle Ben. Just these <laughs> wonderful, right. folksy people um, who had wonderful stories to tell and, and, and everything. And we drove home, and by the time Mom got on the phone to put in an offer on the place, they already had an offer. And we're, we're going to be, they were going to be under agreement. It went that fast. Wow. Well, I mean, you can always put in a backup. A lot of times those fall through, but... We did. Yeah. We did. The yeah, other oh, thing is, good. yeah. The other thing is because this area is one of the few areas where pro housing prices are going up. Uh, it was just at the oh, edge okay. of our affordability range, so we were right, like, right. we would we would not have offered this much if it was just the same house, but not Gilbert's, right? 
If the, yeah. If it was the, if, if it was the house next door, we, you know, and it was equally as nice, we would not have been in such a hurry to, to offer that much money. So the search for housing continues, but that I got to stand in Uncle Gilbert's house. I got to go down into the basement where he used to do all his tinkering and see his workbench. Ah. So, yeah, that was a cool moment for me. I'm sorry to burn so much of the diecast on such a personal moment, but I know there's like five people in the in the uh, that listen to this show that'll care about it. <laughs> well, I I I've been to old houses like that. My uh my wife's grandfather uh, and, and most of her extended family her, on her dad's side is up in um, Rhode Island. And so we went up. He had cancer and was, was failing. So oh. we went up to visit him and we got to see his, you know, he took us down the basement and shows his, you know, he's got lathes and drill presses and stuff in there. And I, maybe it's an East Coast thing where you've got like a, a basement workshop. Yeah. 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 People in California don't tend to have basements. Yeah, I don't know why it's. I mean, I well, it's earthquakes, but uh, it makes it a right. lot easier to to cool the house if you got a basement because here the ground temperature is like seventy degrees, so it's perfect for that. Yeah, uh, although here we have to be careful. You get damp basements, and they just turn into a mildew farm if you're not careful. And then you know, if you've like, oh, got sure. allergies, then you're growing mildew and making your sick and. It, it can get really bad if you just never go down in your basement, never turn the lights on, don't keep it dry. You can, <laughs> you can walk down there Mushroom one day, farm, huh? right? You go down there one day and the walls will be black, and it can actually make you sick. It's it's that bad, but that, I mean that takes years of yeah, neglect. Yikes. Anyway, so that was interesting. Well, good luck on your consideration of moving. We our search continues. Yes. We'll find some place to live eventually. Um, yeah. So, so ne oh, speaking of places to live, is that where? <laughs> yeah. That's the segue. Uh, that's the segue. Sometimes that's we're going you with. gotta build your own place to live, like in Satisfactory, because <laughs> that's what I do. I'm like, we need a place to live. Well, let me build, you know, uh, you know, a 500 acre industrial complex for us to live in. You've seen my bases. And I've seen your bases, but yes. I don't know if the audience has seen pictures of your bases because you actually do build like houses and, and buildings and things. I just build like conveyor belt hell. Right. If if our bases were houses, your base is like a living room set sitting out in the yard and then you walk down a mud hill to the television set and then you scramble up a, a, an embankment and come over that and find the toilet in the middle of a field. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's yes. your base. And then my base is maybe a bit over engineered. Uh, you know, there's walls everywhere. It's real nice. Every every conceptual product has its own building, but that means makes the place really, really sprawling. It's just huge. It, you can find stuff quickly. You don't get lost. And if I come back in a few months, I'll know where everything is. But I don't know if I'll come back in a few months. Ah, uh, right. The the downside of building like like I do is that it just it's very slow. And so for me, the game feels ponderous. I see. But I can't help it. My OCD is too strong. <laughs> yeah. It's been really fun to start coloring because I've I've started doing a little bit of coloring now, and it makes it a lot easier to not get disoriented. Like because you can imagine, yeah, you you're working at a workbench or something, or you go to grab some parts, or you go to grab a sandwich, and you come back and you're like, okay, where am I? And you spin around a little bit, and it takes you like a good two or three seconds to kind of orient yourself in this mayhem. It's like a white noise conveyor belts and, and lifts and constructors right. and things moving all the time and, and train tracks overhead and all that stuff. So like, but just by coloring a few buildings of like, this is my you know, uh, exploration train station where the train comes back and unloads all the wood and leaves and things. And like, here's my dump station where I send all the trains that have extra stuff to dump them in the, the crusher. And like just adding a few color points is like, oh, that's where I am. And it, it's, it becomes so much quicker to, to figure out where you are. So it's, it's been fun to kind of add a little touches of color here and there. Yeah. Oh, I, I could not, could not navigate my base without color. I, I had to tear down one of the buildings. I had to tear down a couple of buildings that were next to each other 
to you know expand them a little bit change the layout a bit you know to account sure. for some of the new technologies and and I didn't get around to painting I started in the desert I, I restarted the game out in that new area and there's like yeah. no flowers there and so I can't True. I only have a tiny amount of paint to go to last me. oh and I did, yeah and I, yeah I did I didn't have enough to repaint anything, so I had to leave these buildings uh, default color. And I was constantly getting lost. I couldn't tell the two buildings apart. And I walked towards <laughs> one and then realized, no, that's the other one. Oh, yeah. I, I depend on that color constantly. You think of it as like a cosmetic feature, but no, it's, it's part of the logistics of the place. It's, it turns it's, out it helps a lot, yeah. Comment your code is how I would call refer to that. <laughs> I'll remember. I know it. I built it. I remember this place. And then you come back after the weekend and you're like, Gandalf, I have no memory of this place. <laughs> Only you don't have a magic fire ring. Right. You're just in the dark and lost. Oh, man. So what do you think of the new starting area? Is it? You said that it was much a much better experience on your post at the beginning of last week, but I'm curious to know like how it's better and like what what did you what did you find more easier to or more fun to play there? Uh, more research. The initial getting coal was a lot nicer. I think getting coal in the green area is like um, a kilometer and a half, and in this area, it's more like 800 meters. Yeah, it's just up the hill. And there's just two of them. There's there's one in one direction, one in the other direction. So it's like take your pick. Oh, for for me, they were both next to each other in a in a ravine. Uh yeah, um hmm. Hmm. So, where exactly did you start? Cuz I I feel like the starting areas are are randomized a bit or well like they'll they are do they randomize the locations of the the resources or do they yes. just randomize the location where you drop? They randomized the location where you drop, and I started building where I dropped. So, yeah, to me, the closest coal was at the end of a ravine. Um, but it had, like, three iron and two copper mines in close-ish proximity to each other. So, I was super happy. That was, you know, that makes that first tier a lot less painful. Yeah. And, and then you could just move your move your hub over there and just work out of there if you wanted to. Right. Um, if, so if that's something you do. I don't know if you move your hub it, after you start. Oh, I move it usually about three times. Like, I just build it on the ground wherever. Just, I build it to the closest resource. And then once I finally have enough concrete to build a f huge elevated platform, I put it up there. And then this, this particular factory is a double-decker. It's like got one huge factory and then the walls are four units tall and then there's another platform on top of that with with all this with all the final things being produced on the roof nice and so every time i build something new i move the hub up a bit so you're just putting the hub on the roof at that point can you ever yes. build stuff over the hub or does it have an infinite uh, obstruction limit I, vertically i don't know if it has an infinite obstruction limit because for those who haven't played the game the the hub is your kind of your main building maybe the name gave that away but it <laughs> launches it launches like this i don't know what you'd call it this hovercraft this rocket i don't know yeah it's a drone it's a drone ship or something drone yeah, rocket it just it supposedly goes to orbit so it just takes straight up it just goes straight up to, uh, you know, out of the atmosphere. So if you have anything above it, it would clip through it. And that, that wouldn't be nice. Um, so be I right. don't know if you can... Right, exactly. I don't want that. The thing I don't like about this new starting area is, wow. Okay, they, they made it so that monsters respawn every day. Yeah, and, that's kind of cool. You, you give out infinite, uh, infinite resources there. They're renewable I, again. Right, right. I wish they dropped flowers because there are no flowers around and I can't <laughs> color code anything. But you anyway, have to take an expedition over to the forests. Right. 
Uh, but there's so much combat. I mean, just uh, trying to get to the south, there's this one passage that leads south, and oh my goodness, it was like just back-to-back -back fights for for like 20 minutes, half an hour, and the combat in this game is not that fun. And after a while, I was just like, I, I want to be done. I haven't even left the desert area yet. And they're all where the corner I'm stuffed into is there are a lot of the secondary level monsters, like the bosses that are really oh, actually yeah, the, the hammerhead fireball guys, the hammerhead fireball guys. And there's a boss spider and they're not far oh, from yeah. each other. And there's a boss and, uh, a ramming hog guy. Yes. And they're all like in fairly close proximity to each other and they all sort of guard the way south. So every time I'm like, this is this time I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna go south. And then <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, this is such a chore, but I just need to get through these guys and you know, expend a bunch of resources getting through them and then discover, oh wait, there's more jerks on the other side of them. All right, well I'll push through. Oh, so there's even more. And I'm just like So what oh. re what tier of weapons are you on? Because there's Okay, so so there's like multiple tiers of weapons, right? There's the there's the little right. uh, taser you got at the start, and that's just miserable to fight with because it doesn't have right. any range, and you can only got like one or two shots out of it. I think it's two shots, and then you're done, and and you won't kill anything in that time. So you can't just like run up to a thing and, and smash it to death. You you gotta like run up and tase it once, and then run away, and then run up and tase it again and run away. And you move slowly enough that the enemies can get you. So it's just like, ugh, fighting is just horrible with a taser. Right. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been, I got the upgraded thing that's like a big sword that like unfolds okay, so, when you Okay, so the next tier is like sword tier, right? Uh, now, right. is the bolt, is the bolt shooter um, above or is that, or is that like a side like path a, that you take? Uh, the, the, the shoots rebar? Yeah, the rebar gun. Uh, yeah, I have that unlocked. It's, of course, it fires super slow, and it doesn't do a lot of damage, but it does let you keep enemies at a distance. So what I do... Yeah, it's it's actually more damage than the gun. Uh, not DPS, but damage per damage per shot, Wait, not damage gun? per second. Gun? I have not unlocked the gun yet. Uh, gun was has been in the game for a while. Have you? Hmm. I haven't seen it pop up in any of the equipment lists. I've been working my way through the research, and I just uh, went it's salt sword? peter, I think, or not salt yeah, peter, oh. uh, uh, sulfur. It's on the so, sulfur yeah, chain. Yeah, I can't find I can't find any sulfur, so that probably oh, stalled no. out. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, you gotta find sulfur. some sulfur. Gotta get yourself some sulfur, boy. Is it is it renewable? Yeah, there are sulfur spots. They're not super common, but when you can scan for but them, they, of course, you just go and find one. And they they like re they re yeah you put a mine on a mine on it yeah oh okay okay all right well then I need to make that a priority it's I thought like, it was yeah it's like crystals stuff, yeah oh man oh yeah sulfur's sulfur's great because then you get the gun and you get the bombs and the bombs are just like I think the bombs are better than the gun I don't know they're they're both super handy okay so so when you're fighting with the rebar gun you probably build a, a scout tower right you climb up the tower and then shoot stuff let me. Let me tell you what I do because it's super okay. cheesy. Oh no! Uh, they've they've uh, they've added some scaffolding and, and stuff to the game. And oh you know, yeah! That, the scaffolding's the, really really nice to build with because you can build down while you're standing on top of it. I just oh, I love it. Right, right. The the one scaffolding it's the same size as the big eight meter slab that the foundation. Right, you know the the big eight meter foundation. There's a yeah yeah. It's just an empty frame version of that. That thing you can build on top of monsters, and they can't nab oh. out of it. So I drop one of the, and you can build a long distance from yourself. So I you just come up cage to, them. I cage them and then I pick them off at a distance. Oh, just for bosses, it's too much trouble to do that for regular monsters. Oh, that's but, so good! I didn't even yeah. think of doing that ever. That's yeah. oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, and then you just trap oh, them and, makes me and so pick happy. them off. <laughs> <laughs> right? They might have been patched. I haven't played in a week and a half now. So maybe hmm. somebody caught that because it felt very exploity. Like, in fact, the the monsters... Are they just breathe... locked in place or do they wander around inside the scaffold or what do they do? They, they sort of wiggle around. I'm not sure what their collision box is doing. But 
what I've noticed is the one that shoots green fire takes um, friendly fire damage, self damage. He shoots at you, <laughs> oh, no. and he can't sh he can't shoot through the scaffold for whatever. Even though those fireballs should fit, they, they for whatever reason it just sort of like instantly goes off in his face. And so nice. the the thing to do is to just stand there and let him kill himself. But once in a while, one will get through whatever this mystery collision box is, and at that point, it. It'll hit you. Then you and you're that'll that'll talk you way down. That that right. I think if you take a full hit of all, how many fireballs does he shoot? Yeah, I don't even know. Yeah, but if you take all of them, or it's the red, I think or it's the fire either. one. It's the fire yeah, one. He it, shoots a thing, and then it shoots off like five fireballs all at once. If you take them all, you die instantly from full health. Right, and uh, so that was a little frustrating. Also, yeah, yeah. So you you kind of have to be a little careful. What I do is play peekaboo. So I stick him in the cage and then I build a shield for myself just out of foundation. Jump out, get him to lob a fireball, and then once I see it coming, jump behind my shield just in case it makes it through the scaffold. Okay. And smart. Then I can kill him without having to like waste any ammo. It takes a long time. D don't think this is like, this is why it's like this half hour hike for me. <laughs> Because, you know, it takes a good minute to kill this guy, and if there's one every 20 feet for some reason, then it's going to take a while. And that's how it is. So my technique with the rebar gun is just to have the the lookout tower on the hot bar, and when I come across an enemy, slap down a lookout tower, climb up the thing, and then just shoot them with the rebar gun until they die. But, you know, that's probably a better strategy overall. Because the spider guys can't climb the rebar, climb the scout tower, which is just oh, it's so good. Because then you hear them coming, and you're just like, Boop, I'm out of here, bug out up the tower. Oh, those spiders give me the willies. Oh, oh see, me too. They're just terrible. The sounds they, they are, make are horrible, and that they look horrible, and they move all nasty. And their and yeah, their hitbox is small, so it's just everything about them is terrible. I my compliments to whoever designed those. They really tapped into like whatever makes you feel arachnophobic like the spiders in minecraft never do anything for me i'm not like oh, it's like i'll just beat this big inflatable spider to death with my wooden sword <laughs> and get on with my day but wow these spiders maybe it's the way they're animated there is something about it that is just oh haunting so those the spiders suck so bad. And the big one, I didn't know there was a big one until this update. Oh, and no! Shame yeah, this ran... poor man. Yeah, that was... And I, I ran, and then I built, like, quickly panicked and built a bunch of foundations around myself to wall myself in. <laughs> and once I was safe, having a panic attack. Right. Once I was safe, I ate, like... All the healing resources I had had a little cry. Yeah, yeah, you got it. You got to deal with it. You got to get through the trauma. Right. There's no way to do it. You... So, and then I just dealt with it. It turns out it was nearly dead anyway. Yeah, I just like, I forget how I killed it, but it was. I shot it with the yeah, rebar. If you gun hit it with the, distance. if you hit it with your sword, like I think three or four times, it there they'll die. But it's in your face the whole time, and it releases poison clouds. Wow, that's horrible. I didn't even know about that. Yeah, if if you're at if you're at range, it'll release a poison cloud and then it'll jump at you. Ugh, they're terrible. They're <laughs> terrible. I there's a on my way to my coal mine, there are roots that stick out of the ground that are black that every time they get me, I'm like, "Oh, spider." Oh, oh it's no. those stupid roots again. And that has to be deliberate. I mean, these are handcrafted levels. So this is a yeah, game designer. Yeah, they don't get a pass on this. This is deliberate. They knew, Whoever designed this knew exactly what they were doing. Jerks. Right? But it's good. It's, it's yeah, terrifying yeah. Oh, in a good it's, way. It's such a good game. Oh, I have one criticism, and this is a harsh one. Is it the, is it the mouse reversal? The wire reverse thing? Oh, that, I mean, that's standing. Let's just assume I that two I... two criticisms. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Uh, let's just assume I ranted about that for five solid minutes, and then at the end of that, all right, good job. Like, good job. And and another thing, why in the latest update did they make all the ores the same color? It's making me crazy. Oh no! Have you seen the new? I, I don't ores? think they're. I, I don't think they're exactly the same color. No, but they're very, they used to be very distinct. Limestone was like pale yellow and coal was pure black and iron was kind of gray and copper had tinges of green. And now they're all just sort of different shades of medium gray. And it makes me crazy. Yeah, I, I wasn't too impressed with the, with the limestone change. I was like, what? Why does it look like iron ore now? Yeah, and the same the same is true for I mean and since they're medium gray, they even look a bit like coal. Coal is just that but darker. Like oh, why right, was this right. change made? Like I can tell them apart if I see them side by side, but I'd like mouse over them if I've just got one in my inventory just to make sure I've got the right one before I shove it into oh, a box no. where it'll go onto a conveyor belt and clog the whole works. Oh, it's so now, bad. Why would hang you on. do that? Are you manually carrying ores around? Well, you just want, you, like, you tear down a miner because you want to upgrade it. But it had a couple units sitting in its thing, so they wind up in your inventory. But that's okay, I've got a buffer crate here. I'll just shove it in there and ah, it'll enter the system. But, you know, sometimes you forget to do that and you end up walking around with this crap in your pocket. And then you're like, wait, what? Which is this? When did this appear in my inventory? <laughs> and you can try and figure out where it is, and what it is, and where it needs to go. And now that I they're all I don't think every buffer crates for ores. Not for ores, but... Um, actually, early in the game I like to do that because I have lots of problems with... Since the later stages are still manually handled, I want to build up ore, you know, in case the whole thing stalls. One machine, you know gets backed up or whatever because I haven't balanced it properly um, yeah. so that the miner will keep working. They, they have fixed one aspect of that that was so annoying for so long where you'd want to upgrade your miner and you had to like tear the old miner out and tear out the conveyor belts and build a new miner and put the conveyor belts back in. And now you can now you can replace them in situ? Yeah. Yeah, they've they put That's in nice. uh, in situ upgrades for miners and for power poles. So if you've got a power pole that you want to add another wire to and it's already maxed out, used to be you had to like manually find where all the wires are going and like replace them so you don't forget and then like tear the old one down right. and hook them up to the new one and it's just it's a huge hassle. Now you just in situ replace power poles. It's fantastic. Quality of life. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to my factory and get some representative screenshots of the place and you do the same and I'll put them in the I'll put them in the show notes and everybody can have a look and if you okay. upload were you happy with uploading this show to YouTube yeah it, it was pretty straightforward it was less than half hour work and uh, you know it wasn't any wasn't any problems uh, just had to okay. wait for it to render I've got to figure out a, a faster way to render that stuff but yeah, it was fine if you try DaVinci Resolve, it is ridiculously fast. I'll have to um, do that. I, I don't know if it's worth it. I mean, you have to learn a new workflow and everything. So it might not be worth it. I'm not. This is not an endorsement. It's, it's a suggestion. <laughs> All right. I, I sense that we have eaten through too much of the show and not covered enough material. Um, so we're, one of us is going to have to go? Is this the, the battle to the death that I've been fearing all these years? No, no, I just, let's let's hurry through the next couple things. Well, we're almost to the mailbags, okay. but here, I have to talk about Teardown. I'm going to have a link to this in the show notes. But once again, a crazy Swedish guy has made a block-based world that is blowing everybody's mind. I thought that was old hat by now. Right, uh, but tear down this guy built an entire world out of voxels only unlike minecraft where the voxels are a meter in this game the voxels are i don't know I'm, i don't know metric enough to say what would be about fist size in centimeters i don't know about that's like many 10 centimeters, centimeters maybe okay 
about 10 centimeters. So that's way smaller than Minecraft, but this means you can make things that are much finer in detail. And, and it has physics, things that burn, working cables that, you know, have tension and can pull objects over and... And the example is telephone poles connected by wires and you can deform any of the geometry in real time. Break blocks and blocks that are no longer supported by physics will fall. And your power pole, pole if, you chop, if you chop a piece out of the middle of it, the top will fall and then pull on those cables and maybe deform the other things. It has, it looks like it's ray traced. It looks like it has ray traced lighting and it's got volumetric fog and debris like so if you set a fire under a wall it's not just like a typical video game fire that'll just sit there and smoke will like if you put a roof directly over a fire in a video game the smoke will just you know the flames and smoke will just clip through the wall in this game, the right, smoke right. will funnel out of the windows of the house when they're done filling it. That kind of thing. It's yeah, it looks like it's doing crazy. a fluid simulation. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And everything about it is amazing. I'm not totally in love with this idea for a game, which is basically you, you have to run around the environment and gather up three key cards. But as soon as you get, gather the first one, a clock begins running and you only have 30 seconds to get all three. And if you just run around normally, you'll never make it. So you have to plan like, oh, I'll build a ramp here, bash a hole in this wall and do whatever, you know, to make it so that you can get to all three of these locations within 30 seconds. Um, like a traversal but, game of some kind. Right. Now, I'm not in love with that, but I am in love with the idea of just playing around with these voxels. It's amazing. There will be a video of it in the show notes. Watch it. The video, when I saw it, only had 3,000 views and it had been up for a few months. I'm like, why is nobody going crazy for this, for this game? It looks pretty like, cool. And I think he's every... doing some level of detail kind of stuff where he, he uh, simulates larger sets of blocks all as, as one thing. And yeah. then... If it gets broken, then he, he breaks that up into pieces. And um, it reminds me a lot of Cortex Command, which is a pixel physics game, uh, but has the same kind of feel of like things that are breaking off and, you know, spalling off little tiny chunks of things that, you know, jitter around and then go into physics sleep and get baked in. And it's pretty cool. Yeah. Noita would be another one that uh, from the past year that was a 2d game but it was doing these immense simulations of fluids and breakable materials and it's just maybe i i can't believe all of this work is being done by one guy and meanwhile the game the game industry as a whole is like let's make another shooter with the unreal engine <laughs> it's like this one guy running circles around them and it's just so amazing to see so yeah, look exciting. at you, Satisfactory. <laughs> I give Satisfactory credit for doing something really different. Giant spiders. <laughs> Mailbag time, dear Diecast. So apparently, Amazon Game Studios is now making a memorpiga called New World. I heard about it for the first time yesterday, and I was curious to get your impressions of this thing. Jennifer Snow. Thank you, Jennifer. So I did not know this we didn't have a diecast last week this email came weeks ago um i did not know about amazon game studios before th uh, maybe somebody told me about it but i'd forgotten so i was like wait what amazon is getting into gaming and reading their their rationale for starting a game studio sounds really good it makes me really care about what they're doing they're like oh you know we're not going to be a crank it out studio we're thinking about creativity and it you know it sounds like they're we're going to do different stuff and they're going to focus on small studios of five to 30 people which i think third you know 30 and under is this magic thing just i know i've never worked on a triple a game but there was a lot of interesting stuff happening when teams were that size and as the teams you know expand up to 100 people 
it becomes more managed by one or two or three people at the very top, and there's less like spontaneous creativity in the design process, right? And that's where a lot of breakthroughs. Yeah, are. you have to you have to have some sort of structure if you've got a big team, and the structure kind of squashes out some of the the spontaneity. Right. So this is like the mid-budget game that I've been begging for for over a decade. I'm like, come on, mid-budget games like 20 million, you know. 5 million to 20 million. Like the indies have the, the space below there. And the AAA have everything above that. But, you know, something kind of cheap, not going for the best graphics, but, you know, doing something like Teardown, where you just like, let's do something wild and see if it catches on. And yeah. It's Why not? Sounds, it sounds like that's what they're going for. And so I'm all excited about it. But then I look at their MMO and it, it's okay. Are you sitting down, Paul? Are you ready for this? I, I am sitting down. Is it? Hang on. Can I guess? Okay. Okay, here we go. One guess. Is it a wow killer? <laughs> I don't even know. It, it, but it is a medieval fantasy MMO. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So all the, the is it screenshots. Ultima Online? <laughs> Well, the graphics aren't that good yet, but they're working on it. <laughs> I, I'm sure Amazon, with their billions of dollars and thousands of employees, can somehow manage that level eventually. Uh, like, it's got, you know, the first three screenshots it shows you is evil volcano in the distance with classic sailing ships in front of it. The is next it the shape picture, of a skull? At least. It is It is not, but it does have... What? It does have... I'm outraged! Okay. But it does have, you know, overcast, and then it has the glowing hole in the clouds that looks like beams are coming down from above or going up, which that's that's almost as much of a trope as a skull-shaped base. So I give them credit there. Okay. All right. Fair enough. And then the next picture is somebody in medieval armor with a couple more dudes. I guess it's not. It looks like one is in a pirate hat, and whatever. And then the next picture is typical, like classic medieval Europe-looking Tudor housing, guys in guys in priest robes, and tri. What's that called? Tricorn helmets. Tricorn or, hats. Yeah. Tricorn hats, and the little the little triangle flags that you know you see at car dealerships. You know, a penance. string of triangle. Yeah, string of pennants. Um, with, a you know, classic well, thatched roof, brick sides. This is just like, if you designed a neural network to design medieval fantasy images based on what's in popular culture, <laughs> this is Which exactly probably what, what they did. <laughs> this is exactly... This is... Okay, carve your destiny. And it's a dude... Holding a torch and a sword. <laughs> like, carve your, carve destiny your destiny with this impractical sword. Why didn't we give you some awl or maybe a, a, a tooling pick? <laughs> right. Oh, here's a priest and some guys with spears. <gasps> There's a guy with a flintlock rifle. See, I accused this game of being unoriginal, but this guy has a flintlock rifle and now I look like a jerk. Obviously, this is the most thing. I don't know. It could be good. This is like alchemy, right? The, the one where they had like magic was suppressed by technology, and so you could like have guns right. and stuff, but then you couldn't cast spells. Whatever. It looks extremely derivative of what came before. So I mean, and it could be it could be new and, and different. Um, then again, you can pre-order for bonus content. So, seems like it's going right down the middle, according to current <laughs> trends. Oh dear. Well, I'm I'm excited to see another player in the in the you know in the ecosystem. It doesn't hurt, but true. I don't know. It seems like really big companies have a really difficult time in creative spaces. Like it, Disney's the only one I can think of that's that's really successful at it. I don't know. All right. There's a lot that are successful, but you know, that makes good quality product. The bad guy has a metal mask in the shape of a skull 
with glowing red eyes and a, okay. and what looks like a and a conquistador helmet. So, um, not going to be super original <laughs> in terms of the villain. I don't know. It could be good. That's the thing. I mean, it, the, WoW is the most derivative fantasy setting ever, and that game I hear it did okay. People keep saying that, you know. So I don't know. Will we ever know? Good. Will we ever know right. if WoW is any good? I, I'm, I've been looking since I started prattling at you. I began looking for a release date, and I don't see. Oh, secure as act, secure access. <clears throat> I'm new to podcasting. Sorry. Ass access. I don't know what this is. Closed beta access in April 2020. All right. Maybe when I'm finished hmm. with Doom Eternal, I'll check this out just to see what Amazon Game Studios is doing. I am uh, going to bet... Finished with Doom Eternal? I, hmm, I don't know if you quite understand Eternal there. <laughs> All right, it'll probably take me like three weeks to get through it. Is it Eternity yet? Your Eternity alarm is going off. Ah, uh, cool. Dear Diecast, I was looking at some... Okay, hang on, we need to talk pronunciation. That was quick. The words L-U-D-U-M space D-A-R-E. Now, anybody who's just, you know, monolingual um, Anglophone like us would probably look at those words and go, Ludum Dare. And, but Chris Franklin, who went to game college basically always pronounced it ludum dare so i was like okay i don't know the roots of this maybe it you know comes from another language and it just happens to look english but then everybody since then has pronounced it ludum dare so i don't know hmm. i'm just going to i'm just going to plow forward and read it how it makes sense to me and if i'm an idiot then i'm an idiot I was looking over some Ludum D I almost said Dare. Ludum Dare <laughs> entries by... You don't even know it looks right anymore. Right? This is like I've reversed the x-axis too many times, or the y-axis on it's my like brain It's like when you say a word times. over and over and it just it turns into nonsense. Right. Ludum Dare entries by Daniel Lisson, Linson and was blown away by Walkie Talkie. If you aren't familiar with it, Walkie Talkie is a chat room where every message you send becomes a platformer level. And there's a link to a video. I'll have it in the show notes. Do you guys keep track of Ludum Dare? If so, what's some of the most impressive things you've seen? Vale, TMVL. TMTVL, I apologize. Um, so this game is funny. Like, it starts with just a typical... Welcome to the chat room. Type this for the rules or whatever. Try to be nice. But every letter or symbol, when you sort of click the button to begin playing, you jump from letter to letter. And Like, on... What do you mean? Like, your cursor or...? Yeah, you get this little... I think your, your character is about the size of a punctuation mark. But all the punctuation your character. in... So, yeah. like, your... See, but now, like, words are made of characters. Is this... Yes. Oh, no. The thing you control, your avatar in this world, is about the size of a punctuation mark. And so you have to traverse this sentence by hopping from letter to letter across this particular chat message. Oh, but no. This is like a, a text platformer? Yes. And each piece of punctuation has special behaviors like a exclamation mark the top of the exclamation mark becomes a wall moving up and down so you've got to time your jump to get over it um oh, three no. dashes yeah three dashes in a row becomes a horizontal platform moving back and forth that will move as far as space allows so if you were to type three minus signs and then a bunch of spaces then it would effectively become a little like platform that you have to ride like in mario to oh ride to wow the other half of the sentence and then i think two dashes is an elevator going up and down i'm not sure i didn't <laughs> but this is such a weird idea and i yeah. i love i love 
Ludum Dare entries, but I never follow it. Like I'm, it's never in my wheelhouse. I never know when it's going on. It's one of those things. It's like, oh, it was last month, and now here's the two most popular games that came out of it. That's interesting, but I don't follow it when it's going on, so I don't have any favorites. Yeah, it is it, an amazing. There's just thing. too many things to follow these days. It's so there's so much indie stuff happening all the time. It's like, when are you gonna, where are you gonna spend your time? Right. All right. Um, there. This is a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna skip here. I'm gonna skip a couple of emails because I feel we're running out of time. Um, this one I had to cut part of the intro. This person. Okay. This person, who is Wang Wang. I'm not judging you, Wang Wang, but other people are going to. Just heads up. <laughs> um, this person said they couldn't find the email for the diecast. Now. The, the, oh, I thought you were going to say they're they're being judged for their name, but no, it's right, for right. The perceptive well, those. that that that's what I was referring to. Is people will judge oh, you okay. for your name, but I'm not going to judge you. But this is an interesting puzzle for me. This person said they couldn't find the email for the diecast. It's in the header image of every show, but not everybody watches the show on my site, and some of them get it through an RSS feed with the images stripped out, and I don't know, I don't know. But it presents, sure. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, the common answer is, well, it's right there, why don't you see it? But anytime, I've seen this happen a lot, people can't find this email, even though I say it at the end of every show, and it's in the header image. Now, if, if it was just one person, I would say, oh, that person wasn't paying attention. But when you have many people running into a problem, it means there's something wrong with your design. And I'm curious... I would like to hear in the comments how many of you, off the top of your head, know the diecast email or where to find it, or if you have no idea. I, and do you have any suggestions for where you would expect to find that email, if not in the header image? Um, I'm just curious, because I'd like to make this a little easier on people. This person couldn't find it, so they left this in the comments on the blog. So I've typed, I've removed that explanation, and now I'm going to read the rest of their in, their message. Now, since you play games as both a hobby and a part-time job, it would be weird to bring this matter up. But has your gaming habit ever conflicted with your life? I am a college student, and in my head, game craving clash with gr game craving clash with studying really hard. I think this is supposed to be game playing clashes with studying really hard. When I open a book, I want to play a game. And when I play a game, I want to study. I try to have a fixed amount of time each day for gaming, but it only lasts a couple of days before I get, get over it. I have this trouble for a long time and I cannot settle it no matter what. I find so many online advices and try to apply, but none of them work. I think this person is not a native speaker. This it's doesn't. Cool. This doesn't feel like typos. We'll, we'll figure out. This feels like. Yeah, yeah. No, this doesn't feel like typos. I don't want anybody to get the impression this person dashed off this message without thought. I think they did put thought into it. It's just English sucks. English does suck. I don't know if my case can be considered game addiction or not. Okay, so we're gonna skip here. And to other people, um, okay. I know you're not a therapist or a consultant, but I like your opinions, most of them, and I hope perhaps you can give some insight to my problem. Okay, Wang Wang. We do not judge on names. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you can't for... stop commenting on it, though. <laughs> One would have been enough! One is all any of us get. Um, so the, the first thing I want to comment on is part-time job. This blog gaming review thing is definitely a full-time job and then some like I get up in the morning I start doing this I do it most of the day and then I spend a couple hours in the evening with my family so this if I was like including everything I have to do this is a this is like a 14 hour a day job but I don't want anybody to like feel sorry for me or worry about burnout I don't get if you want to know how I avoid burnout and whatever uh, send me another, somebody can send me an email, but the the point I'm getting at is this is a more than full-time job, but You know it is a lot of that time is spent playing games, so 
I don't want you to think of me slaving. And it, the rest of it is creative work. So it's very enriching, satisfying work. And that ties into the answer to this question. Um, have I ever, has my gaming ever inf interfered with my life? Um, not really. Uh, it was a little bit because my wife, um, my wife once in a while, she has to elbow me and like, hey, are we going to spend some time together? Like, can we go out on a date? Can we do something <laughs> together? And I'll be like, oh, right, family stuff. Because if you leave me to my own devices, I will just do my thing all day. But other than that, no, it's never interfered with my job. But the, the thing about that is I'm a naturally a, an incredibly focused person. I sit down and I do one thing. I'm the opposite problem from you, Wang Wang, is that I get stuck doing something and I can't pull myself away from it. So when I dive into work, I can't stop working. When I start playing a game, I can't stop playing the game unless it really sucks. And so I don't <laughs> I don't have problem with with managing a balance between gaming and everything else, even before I started, you know, kind of playing games for a living. It was always like, it was always hard to tear me away from one thing into the other, but, you know, once I got there, I was fine with just working. So it wasn't a big deal. Paul, have you ever struggled to I, I I gather you don't because you don't play a lot of games, but has is this ever a problem for you? Yeah, so, I mean, when I was in college, I played, I think I've said this before on the show, but Say it again. When I was in college, I played some World of Warcraft, and it right. was too it was too gra it was too uh, gripping for me. Like I couldn't I couldn't manage my 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 gameplay time to be reasonable to have a reasonable work life balance kind of thing or game life balance or whatever. And so I just quit. I I did not play any World of Warcraft. I still don't play any World of Warcraft. Like I don't have an account. I don't pay the monthly fee. I don't. It's not installed on any of my computers. We. You know, it's not a thing I do because I, I just I couldn't I couldn't trust myself to to behave responsibly. Um, and occasionally games will, will do that where, you know, I stay up till three or four a.m. Uh, and I have to get up to work tomorrow morning. And it's like, oh, man, I shouldn't have done that. But but Dwarf Fortress had a release <laughs> yesterday or something. Right. I remember doing that once. I ran out and bought um, the old Sierra Adventure game, where you, where you where you play King Arthur, and you have to restore the kingdom. King's I Quest? It. No, it was not King's Quest. I know that. Like, I keep wanting to say King's Quest, but I know it was not King's Quest. It was what was it called? It, something Quest for Camelot or something? I can't remember what it was called, but it's classic Sierra Adventure. And I, I was playing it with my brother, and that was the secret thing where neither of us could quit. So we were both just sitting there oh, at the game, no. trying, and we played through three quarters of the game in one night, like just kept playing until six in the morning. And I don't know if we were even out of school yet, so I don't know what's going, oh, no. like what the consequences of that were or if I just skipped a night of, I definitely skipped a night of sleep <laughs> but that's the one time I remember going really crazy in a time of my life where it would have mattered um but it's for Wang Wing situation yeah for Wang Wing situation it sounds like it's just like lack of self-control um and and I get that way too it's like you, you don't want to do you don't want to deal with your responsibilities and it's really easy to just say, oh, I'm going to play a game instead. But the thing is that even in games, you have responsibilities. And so when you get into the game, you're like, I still don't want to deal with my responsibilities. And so then you're like, okay, well, I should probably go study because then I don't have to deal with this game telling me that I have to do things. And I mean, like, yeah, you can't escape that. There are responsibilities you have to deal with. And with practice, you will learn to deal with them. But yeah, there are certainly times when I don't want to go to work. I want to keep playing satisfactory or whatever. Or I don't want to sort out my nightmare cables in satisfactory. I want to do something else. And it's like, well, you know, you have to 
apply some level of self-control. That's my advice. Uh, 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 to take a contrary position, I know some people have no compulsion to play games. Like the, yeah, They could pick up the most interesting and grossing game in the world, play it, get to know it and have like no idea why anybody would like I why this is dumb I don't care and they'll walk away from it and their brain will never think about it again and then there's me who will become engrossed in the game and so taking that as two points on a continuum there must be some people beyond me who are even more engrossed in the game than I do than I become just I'm going to assume I'm not the most and the most obsessive person with games in the world, there must be people who are worse. And for those people, pulling themselves away from a game would be even harder. And I think Paul has good advice, though. Know what things trap you and and avoid them. Like, he, he yeah, recognized... If you really have been applying yourself and you just can't handle it, then you have to... You have to let it go. Either either you have to let games go or you have to let the rest of your life go. And you get to make that choice. I mean, the same is true for a lot of substances people abuse. Like, anytime you yeah. have impulse control, with, you know, some people are weak in one area. Other people are weak in another area. There are, you know, everybody's got their, their kryptonite. And, and you kind of have to figure out what is my kryptonite and then avoid it. Or, or or just accept that you're going to have a really low quality life filled with dysfunction. So I guess we are saying that it sounds like gaming addiction. I guess so. Or find a career where the where the addiction, you know, just sort of fee, sort of healthy become a game critic. <laughs> somebody that can't somebody that can't stop playing a game game once they stop. They'll fit right in on the three-day review cycle. Yeah, that's true. We, we need you to binge through this game. All right. Well, that is, we still have some more emails, but I feel like we've done a show, Paul. All right. We'll have some leftover for next week. Yeah. So if In case you people can't find the email address in the header image, which that's where it is. That's correct. And if you're too lazy to go look at the header image, uh, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. And that's the show. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Thanks for everybody to... Isaac, let me take that line again. No, leave it in. No. <laughs> Thanks to everybody... <laughs> oh, you mock my... You mock my failures as a person. <laughs> you mock my inability to speak clearly.